Hi there. In this section, we're going to keep going with chapter four, and we're going to look a little closer at hypothesis testing. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what happens if you make a statistical decision and it's a mistake. And so there's two kinds of errors that can happen. Um, so with any statistical test, if you're using the decision rule to make a statistical decision, you could either be right or wrong for each decision. And so that leads us to this table down here. Um, you always either reject the null or do not reject the null hypothesis. That's sort of how that works, right? But in reality, if the null is true and you reject it, then you've made what's called a type one error. If the null is false and you, you do not reject it, that's called a type two error. So mostly in this section, we're concerned with what these errors mean, and we're gonna be computing the probability of a type one error. We are not really capable of computing the probability of a type two error at this stage um, of what we've learned. It's much more complicated. Um, so, but at least you'll know what it is, but we will be able to compute a type one error. So a type one error is what we call a false positive rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true type 2 error is what we call false negative right failing to reject the null when it's false uh, and then a quick note at the bottom in most statistical research it is never discovered if the null is actually true or false what we're interested in is the likelihood of these situations taking place and interpreting what they mean so that's mostly what we're going to focus on in this section at least the first half of this section So a hypothesis test is often compared to a criminal trial. We presume that the defendant is innocent, that's our null hypothesis, unless there's enough evidence to prove guilt, that's our alternative hypothesis, beyond a reasonable doubt, and that would be p-value less than alpha. So before we go, go on, let's, let's really talk about this because it's, it's very, very important. Um, so it's not just that the hypothesis test is compared to a criminal trial, even though that is true. It's that the um, statistical method that we use was designed to emulate a criminal trial, actually. Um, and what that means is that in order to reject a null hypothesis, ordinarily, researchers need a lot of evidence. Now, that's good, because you don't want just um, some, you know, one-off study completely changing what people believe about something. So that's what reasonable doubt means, right? Um, and so a type 1 error is comparable to convicting a truly innocent person. So if you, you're presuming the defendant is innocent, but overwhelming evidence could come up, in which case the jury would decide to convict and that person might be truly innocent. And a type 2 error is comparable to releasing a truly guilty person. Similar situation, right? The person might actually be guilty, but there's not enough evidence to convict. And so uh, we would release, or the, the jurors would release uh, this person who's actually guilty. And so the analogy is more than just surface level. Um, one common, uh, and I talked about on a previous slide, but one common thread with this analogy is that in statistics a lot of times uh, researchers never find out if the null hypothesis is true or false just like in a criminal trial um, in the vast majority of cases nobody actually knows if the person other than you know the defendant himself or herself uh, nobody really knows if that person is truly guilty or truly innocent so it's more than just a, a surface level analogy so let's talk more about type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, so in the situation below, describe what it means in context to make a type 1 and type 2 error. So uh, what do we have here? Testing a new drug with potentially dangerous side effects to see if it's significantly better than the drug currently in use. If it is found to be more effective, it will be prescribed to millions of people. So let's think about this. So the null hypothesis is always that the new drug is not better, right? That they're the same. The, the null hypothesis is always new drug is equal to the old drug. 
So the alternative hypothesis would be the new drug is greater than, so like the um, recovery rate is greater than, however you're measuring it, right? Um, so a type 1 error would be a false positive. That would mean there is significant evidence that the new drug is better, but it's not actually better. And a type 2 error is sort of the inverse of that, whereas the drug actually is better, but the study did not provide evidence to show that it was better. And the answers are here on the next slide. Now, when you're testing drugs, over time, you actually do find out which drug is better. It might take 10 or 20 years, but generally speaking, researchers always find out um, eventually what happens. But in the short run, after a drug goes through its testing phase, it's usually approved um, if it shows results. But it, but it could be shown later on down the road that it's not actually better. So that's a good example right and if you ever get mixed up just think you know false positive is type one and the other one is the type two right so while we wish to avoid both types of errors in practice we have to accept some trade-off between them if we make it very hard to convict a defendant in a criminal court then we will end up letting many truly guilty people go free on the other hand, making it easier to convict a defendant would reduce the chance of letting a guilty person go free, but increase the chance of convicting a truly innocent person. So let's talk about this. So this is one of the, the deeper um, philosophical implications of statistics. You might not think that that would happen in a science class, that we'd have some philosophy. But it turns out we do, right? Statistics is math, um, but a lot of the the thresholds that we set like alpha and things like that these are agreements that are more or less um, agreed upon by different parties so that statistical research can move forward but mistakes do happen and so in order to control those mistakes um, the researchers need to think about what would be worse a type 1 error or a type 2 error and you might think well we don't want either error but it turns out you have to have a relatively high percentage of one or the other types of error. So it's due to the mathematics of it, but it's also due to just the decision making process itself. So let's let's look at this and really think about it. So what 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 would this mean? What would it mean to make it hard to convict a defendant in a criminal court? What would that mean? So think about if you got called to jury duty for a murder charge, for a first-degree murder charge, what do you think the judge is going to tell you as a juror? He's going to say, now remember, the penalty for first-degree murder is very serious. Make sure you have very strong evidence to convict. In other words, a judge does not want to send a truly innocent person to uh, to prison uh, for a long time for a crime that he or she did not commit. And so that's what it means, right? If it's hard to convict a defendant, that means lots of evidence is needed. If lots of convincing evidence is needed, then in most cases, it's going to be hard to convict just any general person. And that means people who are actually guilty are going to go free. Now, let's look at the flip side of that. Let's say it's a lesser charge, but it's still a criminal trial. The amount of evidence needed is still reasonable, like beyond reasonable doubt, to convict. But maybe it's not as extreme as you would get in a first-degree murder trial. And so making it easier to convict a defendant reduces the chances of letting a guilty person go free. So if that person actually committed that crime, lowering the amount of evidence needed would make it easier to convict a truly guilty person, but that would naturally, just by random chance, increase the chances of convicting a truly innocent person. Right? Because not everybody who's convicted actually did the crime. Right? 
So there are differences, right? So, and that's really what we're looking at here. And it turns out this analogy is really good for understanding the statistics version of this. And this is how we use the significance level to control the types of errors. So it turns out our significance level alpha is the allowable probability of making a type one error. So researchers decide how bad is a type one error compared to a type two, and the alpha value is set accordingly. Most of the time alpha is 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or 0 0.10. So if you lower alpha, right, that makes it harder to reject the null hypothesis, which decreases the chances of making a type one error but it will naturally increase the chance of making a type two error. And so this is, it's a balancing act. If you raise alpha, um, it's easier to reject the null hypothesis, but that also increases the chances of making a type one error, but it does decrease the chance of making a type two error. So it's a very complicated interplay between um, setting alpha the sample size is important. We're not getting into the mathematics of that. I'm just telling you how it works. Um, the sample size is important and the truth of the null hypothesis, which sometimes is never known. So it's a very complicated interplay before, between all these. Okay, so let's see if we can apply what we've just seen. Um, so if the consequences of a type one error are severe, for example, approving a new drug that is potentially dangerous, we might use a very small alpha, maybe even 0 0.005. So this would be the equivalent in our analogy of a first degree murder trial, right? If, um, a, if the null hypothesis is to be rejected, it can only be done so with lots of evidence. If the consequences of a type two error are severe, for example, failing to diagnose a treatable disease. We want to make it easier to reject the null hypothesis. So we might use a relatively large alpha. Now, many students have a tough time thinking about like when this would happen. This one, it's more obvious because you can think of a dangerous drug. Uh, you don't, you know, you want to make sure that it works. If it could save more lives, then it could um, negatively affect but what about a situation here? So what does this mean? Well, um, one good example would be like hepatitis. Uh, there's a lot of subpopulations in, in the United States that where hepatitis is transmitted very quickly. And you have to think of a hepatitis test. Um, if a false positive on a hepatitis test would be telling somebody they have it, but they don't really have it. Now that might seem bad, but it's worse if somebody has hepatitis and the test shows that they don't have it because then they will go back out in the world and potentially spread this disease. So that's sort of how it works, right? Um, again, this is hard to imagine situations, but just think of a common disease that's treatable or even a condition that's treatable. Right? It doesn't have to be a disease, right? Just any condition that's treatable. Um, all right, let's keep going. So now, starting on this slide, we're going to start to get into um, the effects of type 1 errors and what happens uh, when studies have type 1 errors. So the whole rest of this lecture is pretty much uh, built on this idea. So if the null hypothesis is true, then 5% of tests using alpha equals 0.05 will incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. This can be a major issue when doing multiple tests. If you do 200 hypothesis tests, all testing for an effect that doesn't exist because the null is true, remember, null hypothesis means no effect, then about 5% of 200, which is about 10 of them, will be reporting a type 1 error. If you do a thousand tests, 5% of a thousand is 50, and so 50 of them will report a type 1 error. So even though an alpha level of 5% seems like it's requiring a lot of evidence, because it is, 
when multiple tests are done, just due to random dumb luck alone, about 5% of the tests will incorrectly reject the null, which is a type 1 error. This problem of multiple testing is made worse by something called publication bias. In many situations, only significant results are published in peer-reviewed journals. And it turns out, worldwide, there are over 28,000 journals. And that's from two years ago. There might be more. Um, so there's a link there if you want to check out the citations on that. Um, so if many tests are conducted, some of them will be significant just by chance. And it may be only these studies we hear about. So what happens is... Uh, a lot of these journals, so the, the business of public, publishing scientific information is competitive. These journals are very expensive. The, the uh, subscription fees are very expensive. So they only want to publish um, significant results because uh, that's what people want to read about. People don't want to read that, you know, it, no link was found between two things. They want to read a link was found, right? And so when these publications publish something, it might be a type 1 error. Um, and so the public perception uh, is that there is an effect. So about 5% of published studies, at least first time published studies, are actually type 1 errors. Uh, and the public perception is that there is an effect, even if other studies might be published later, that show an effect doesn't exist. So this is true with everything that you've heard. Many people uh, freely sp spread misinformation, not because they don't know that it's not true. It's because when the, the, the information was released, maybe it was the only piece of information related to that event. When something comes along later and shows it's not true, it's too late. The public perception is already that the effect uh, exists even if it turns out that it doesn't and so there's a nice video here there's a YouTube link very cool video if you're interested in this sort of thing don't have time to go into it but that's a it's a very cool link to a science video um, so let's keep going so here's an example of publication bias again another link because uh, I'm citing sources not from the textbook uh, so the Attorney General of New York charged a pharmaceutical company with suppressing studies about the safety and effectiveness of an antidepressant. The company performed several studies with adolescents as subjects, but they suppressed negative studies showing that the drug was associated to increased risk of suicide and the drug was not effective. During the trial, the company stated that it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated as this would undermine the profile of the drug. So this is just an example of, of a drug company um, doing lots of tests and just cherry picking the, the significant results uh, and publishing those and getting the drug approved when it turns out that there was this other information uh, that if taken all together would show that the drug was not effective in a certain group of people, namely uh, adolescents. And... Um, it's very unethical, but clearly this kind of stuff goes on. So if you want to read more about this, um, it's pretty interesting. But just an example, right? How publication bias works. Once something's published and it's a significant result, it's hard to erase that false positive uh, from people's memories. Very difficult. In some situations, making a type 1 error can be very problematic, such as when the study results have important implications that will change current practice. In these situations, studies yielding statistical significance should be replicated or reproduced with another study. The second study can either reject the null, proving further com confirmation that the alternative is true, or fail to reject the null, suggesting that the first study may have yielded a type 1 error. So this is one way to fight back against uh, publication bias. But again, it's still a slow process, right? And the way that science advances forward, whether we're talking about social science, uh, economics, medicine, or you know any of that, biology, animal science, you name it. Uh, it's, a, it's a collection of knowledge. One study usually doesn't completely overturn the way people do things. But 
over time, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 studies, all with similar um, methodology, studying similar outcomes, gives uh, scientists a good, uh, like a big picture, like a good overview of how things work, and we draw conclusions from that. Usually it's not one study. <clears throat> all right, let's keep going. Next up, statistical versus practical significance. If the p-value is less than the significance value alpha, then the results of a hypothesis test are said to be statistically significant. So that's actually the definition of st statistically significant, right? Uh, from section 4.3. The practical significance of the results must be considered within the context of the problem. If the results are not useful or enlightening, then statistically significant results might not be practically significant. This is actually very, very important when statistics is used in the real world. But it's hard to uh, come up with lots of examples of this. So just make sure that you're understanding the meaning of this. Uh, this is similar to like what we did earlier in the class with confounding variables, where you have to understand what a confounding variable is, but you don't have to think of a confounding variable on your own. This is similar to that, where... Uh, this is a real-world problem that pops up that you should be aware of and be able to recognize even if you can't come up with it on your own because some of these examples can be a little tough. So hopefully this first example is an easy one for you and you can understand what's going on. So Plano, Texas has a traffic problem. So another link here to an article uh, from the Dallas News about this poor county in Texas. Uh, that literally cannot add enough roads to accommodate the number of people who keep moving there. And the roads are just jam-packed constantly. Um, so the mean travel time to work for all 780,000 residents of Collin County is estimated to be 27.3 minutes. So that's data collected from stoplight cameras and things like that. Or um, GPS data from phones. So this is from the population. So the Department of Transportation in Texas reprogrammed all the traffic lights in the county to attempt to reduce travel time. So that sounds like a worthy endeavor. Let's help these poor people out who are just stuck in traffic all the time. To determine whether there is evidence that the travel time is decreased as a result of the reprogramming, a random sample of 2,500 commuters is surveyed about their travel time to work. The sample mean is 27.0 minutes with a standard deviation of 8.5 minutes. Does this result suggest that travel time is decreased at the alpha equals 5% level of significance? So we can evaluate this pretty easily with a randomization distribution, right? So the parameter is mu. So I'm just going through, I'm kind of doing this problem like, uh, like a problem from section 4.3. Right, where we, it's a five five step process to, to solving these things. So identify the parameter and then the hypotheses. Right, so we're interested in the mean commute time for all drivers in the county. The hypotheses is so our null hypothesis is that the old travel time has not changed. The uh, alternative hypothesis is that uh, that the new uh, the new traffic time is less, so the new commute time is less than the old commute time. And I did a randomization distribution and got a p-value of 0 0.039. So I went ahead, um, I have the data, you don't have to worry about it, it's a huge data set. So I went ahead and got, got us a p-value for this. And then on the interpretation side, you as the student would have to be able to interpret this, right? So you're not given the data, you're just given the results. How do we interpret this? So explain why the test result is statistically significant, but not practically significant. Well, statistically significant is easy, right? That just means the p-value is less than 5%. That means we have sufficient evidence to conclude that the alternative hypothesis is true. So we're concluding that the mean commute time for all drivers is indeed less than the old commute time of 27.3 minutes. So the driver's commute time as a population has been significantly reduced. And you might think, great, and, you, and we'd stop there. 
But this goes back to that publication bias, right? Should we publish these results? Should th so this is a real study. Um, so should the uh, researchers have published these results? Well, let's see. We need to show that these results are not practically significant. So how do we do that? So practical significance means that the results have to be useful or enlightening. So we, I mean, what have we learned? We've learned that, you know, uh, the new traffic signals have sped up the, the driving process. That's good. What about useful? Well, let's think about that. How much actual time was saved on average for commuters after the lights were reprogrammed? So that's something we have to think about. Let's go look. The new sample mean is 27.0 minutes. The old travel time was 27.3 minutes. So how much actual time was saved? Well, 27.3 minutes minus 27 minutes is 0.3 minutes, which is 18 seconds. So the Department of Transportation spent millions of dollars doing this and saved everybody an average of 18 seconds a day. Doesn't really seem like a good use of resources and certainly doesn't seem like something they should publish uh, and pat themselves on the back for doing such a good job with statistics. Right? So that's the answer. Statistically significant means p-value less than alpha. Practically significant means... Can the results be applied in a useful way? Practical. Are they practical? Is 18 seconds worth spending a lot of public money? Probably not. And so this example shows that a difference that is statistically significant might not have much practical significance. So before we go any farther with this slide, just think about it. Why is this happening? Like what went wrong? Was something flawed in the study that they... Do bad sampling? Is it a bad randomization distribution? Well, it turns out that the sample size used in the study was too large. Uh, so just think about why that would be bad, right? By using a large sample size uh, of 2,500, a small difference such as 18 seconds might turn out to be statistically significant. Remember, statistically significant just means unlikely to be due to random chance. It doesn't have anything to do with the applications of the results. So that does not necessarily mean that the difference is going to be particularly important to individuals making a decision. So whoever's in charge of the traffic lights in this county, if they're going to read this study and go, would they, would they say that the reprogramming has succeeded in any practical way? No, they probably want to uh, keep working on expanding the roads, maybe implement some sort of public transportation initiative or something, because saving everyone 18 seconds, that's basically, what, a third of a traffic light? It's not a lot of time. So statistical significance and practical significance must be evaluated separately you are not going to have to come up with examples of practical significance. But if an example is given to you, you need to be able to say statistical significance is this, practical significance is that. This is a difficult concept for a lot of people to understand. Um, so if you have questions, as always, let me know. This is something worth talking about during class, of course. So the researchers should specify an acceptable range of practically significant results before collecting data. And this is something that didn't happen in this study. Perhaps the study in example two could have achieved practical significance with a difference of two minutes instead of 0.3 minutes. Well, that two minutes, that's part of a confidence interval, right? That would be a margin of error on a confidence interval. This larger range of two minutes could possibly be achieved with a much smaller sample size of around uh, 250 instead of 2,500. Samples that are too large can have statistically significant results without much practical significance. So we're actually going to study this in more detail in Chapter 6. Um, how to specify a margin of error and then adjust the sample size accordingly. And then um, a researcher should go sample um, a sample size of that size 
so that the margin of error is the right size uh, to cover practical significance. So there's a lot going on there. Um, again, think about it. If you have questions, let me know. Let's keep rolling. So let's talk more about sample size. Uh, in chapter three, we saw that larger samples have less variability among their sample statistics. This rule also applies to randomization distributions. Uh, with a large sample size, it is easier to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. So when we say easier here, we just mean less evidence is needed from the sample itself. The sample needs to provide less evidence. Because there's less variability among sample statistics, the standard error is smaller, which makes our 95% rule smaller. So unusual values are much more common. With a small sample size, it may be hard to find significant results, even when the alternative hypothesis is true. So this is kind of, we're kind of peeking into a window of more in-depth, more complicated statistics that is beyond what we study. But if this is interesting to any of you going into math or science or medicine, um, this is a window into how drug testing works um, and how they test vaccines and that stuff is all related to this. How do the researchers figure out? We need a large sample, but not too large. And we need, but it can't be too small either. So where's the sweet spot for the sample size? And it's, it's an interesting uh, math problem. So here's uh, an example of how the size of a sample can affect um, a, a hypothesis test. So here, I'm just, just pick the most basic one I could, right? So we're going to test uh, P equals 0.5 against P is greater than 0.5 for two samples at the bottom. Indicate whether each is significant at the 5% level and which sample provides the strongest evidence for the alternative hypothesis. So let's look here. If we're trying to show, um, or if we think that the evidence is going to show us that P is greater than 0.5, which of these two samples provides the strongest evidence? Now you might think, wait a second, this is 0.55, this is 0.55, so they provide the same amount of evidence. But that's not how randomization distributions work. So what we have to do is we have to put this data in the static key, generate the distribution, uh, and uh, click the tail, so here there's a right tail, and actually look at the p-value. And that's what I did on this slide. So if P hat is 55 out of 100, so is 55 out of 100 convincing enough evidence uh, that the population is indeed greater than 50%? Well, there's the randomization distribution, right? The null hypothesis is 0.5. There's the sample statistic. There's the p-value. That p-value is fairly large, right? It's certainly not significant at the 5% level. So this sample does not provide strong enough evidence that the alternative hypothesis is true. What about P hat 550 out of 1,000? It's still 55%, but what happens when we generate the randomization distribution? Well, you can see that almost all the dots are lower than 0.55. We're here, a whole bunch of dots are above it. Here, there's only one dot bigger. So that p-value is 0.01, right? Here, there were 179 dots above 0.55. Here, there's one right there. That's certainly significant. So not only is it more significant, it's a lot more significant. So what's going on here? Well, this goes back to what we talked about in, on the past few slides, where if the alternative hypothesis is true, it's easier to reject the null. So we don't know if the alternative hypothesis is true or not here, but there's only a 1% chance of a type 1 error, right? A false positive. So that's pretty good chance, a 1 in a 1,000 chance. So that's very unlikely. But here... Again, we don't know if the alternative hypothesis is true, but the 
a type one error is like an 18% chance. So, so we call this stronger evidence because it's less likely to be due to random chance alone, right? It's less likely to, to, um, to give us a type one error basically. So hopefully this taken together with the other stuff we've studied from chapter three and so far in chapter four, uh, comes together and makes more sense. This is also true for confidence intervals, but we don't do p-values with confidence intervals. So here's a little summary of what we just talked about for the last six or seven slides. With a small sample size, it may be hard to find significant results, even when the alternative hypothesis is true. With a larger sample size, it's easier to find significant results when the alternative hypothesis is true, but we should be especially careful to distinguish between statistical significance and practical significance. So the moral of the story here is that there is a sweet spot with sample sizes. Too small, um, the test itself isn't, well, the term, the technical term is powerful. It's not powerful enough to reject the null when the alternative is true. Large sample sizes are very powerful, but it may be too powerful because we might get a statistically significant result that is not correspondingly practically significant. So that's kind of the summary of how all that stuff ties together. All right, well, that's it for section 4.4. As always, if you have questions, let me know. There's a lot going on here, um, so make sure you're reading over it. The examples in the book are really good. I just didn't want this video to go too long, so I only did three examples. And if you need more practice, there's a few good book problems that you can use to practice. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.